Welcome, everybody, in another episode of Secret Skin. So everybody's got OGs, but not everybody's OGs are legendary. So I'm honored to be talking to somebody I'm honored to even say is an OG of mine. And I've recently read his book, My Kaleidoscope, which is... Uh, filled in a story like it was already a legendary story but now I've had a lot of those blanks filled in for me and I'm even more amazed by the journey so I'm sitting here with Micah Nine how you doing today man it's all love it's a beautiful phrase you use it a lot and and it comes up in the book a lot too one of the things that jumped out to me at one point it says Oh, Mike is like the Forrest Gump of hip hop because he's been to all of these different places. Just like in the movie, they put Forrest Gump in all these different, you know, historical moments, right? I've actually thought of myself as such. It really kind of lines up. And in the spirit of that, I thought I saw there was a bunch of interesting meetings you had with people that get outlined in the book. And I wanted to run through a couple of those just to get your reflections on them and have you retell a little bit of the story just for people who haven't read it. There's a story about you meeting a young Warren G. I mean, I love that story, oh, and I'd, I'd love it if you if you tell that one a little bit. Again, we young MCs back then, and, and that's what a, year was this? I would say he was about thirteen or fourteen. Mm-hmm. Doing that, so I was probably about the same age, or maybe fourteen, fifteen. And different sound systems would rent these flatbed trucks. They would put the big speakers on them. You know, shout out DJ Slip and and just people from back in the day like that. They had the big sound system, big Sermo Vegas, all of them. Just, you know, a whole garage full of speakers and amps and stuff. And they would just roll up and set it up on Santa Barbara back then between Malton and Buckingham. They got it open in that little side cut area where cars parked, but they got it blocked off. And I'm there early because I'm knocking up games in, in a laundromat. You know, they had like the Pac-Man, Donkey Kong and all of that <laughs> back then. So you just knock up the games, hit the game and you get, get credits. Ding, 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 ding. So I'm just playing that shit. I see the truck come in. I'm still playing, playing. Then later I see them setting up and I start hearing music bumping, but it's low. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I don't know what's up. I think I might have called AC, AC alone or something. Everybody came and met with me. He might have been there playing video games with me too. Back then it was like, okay, you could battle. We would battle anybody. Right. You know, on what's the street. What's up with the real B-boy buses, battle? <laughs> uh, for coin, not whatever. High school, high school, because I'm balling too. You know, by the time I'm like in the ninth grade, 10th grade, so I'm going around these different schools. But back then, I think I was on that young shyness. Because at that age, I think I might have just started battling, but I probably hadn't really had like a stage performance. Like I think that was pre-pep rally, uh, pre-talent show. I was rapping, rap on the bus, of course, and battle, of course, with the b-boying and all of that, you know, rap with the homies. But here we are. There's a stage kind of like, and you know, Dr. Dre is spinning. And back Dre's. then, he was getting out of the more glamorous phase because back then, a lot of hip hoppers used to, you know, wear a lot of flamboyant clothes, you know, like Melly Mel and them costumes. And on the West Coast, there was like a lot of sequence of glitter and, and gloves and stuff. And I remember Dre, he had like the young curl shag. A little post disco flavor. Yeah, but you know, he might have had a, a, a proper little members only. And, you know, maybe a white members only. And, but he had a glove. You know, that's the doctor, the glove. You might even have the stethoscope thing on his neck. But, <laughs> he's, full but he's spinning, but he's spinning, though. And he's cutting it up. Calling Dr. Dre to surgery. <laughs> might have been the first time I seen Dre live. I'm, like, trying to inch my way to the stage. Because right. I was also with commandeering the microphone. Remind me what Rakim said, uh... Kick a hole in the speaker, pull the plug, you're not jet. You know, like, yeah, that age, you hip hop, and when you want to get on. And uh, I'm just getting closer. There's a stairway that goes right up to the flatbed, right? And so I'm looking over to my left, and there's Dre up there. But then as I'm walking up, I see this kid standing next to me, right? And he's kind of doing the same thing I'm doing, kind of inching closer as we're watching. And we, you know, he might have got at me like, hey, what's up, man? You know? What's up? I was like, what's up, man? <laughs> I'm talking about the conversation of a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old. You know, now, <laughs> you swear you bought your business, but you don't right. know shit. He, he was Warren G back then, though. His whole mannerisms, his demeanor, the whole yeah. science, right? And, you know, I'm microphone Mike. I'm, I'm with Kang. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I think I'm dressed a little more warm. He might have just had a T-shirt, but he had a little gold chain. Might have had some corduroys with a little feeler belt, a gray and black Puma wind suit or something like, and it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> I know I had a turtleneck under it. He's spinning, and uh, I'm like, "You gonna rap? 
you know how to rap, you rap. It's like, how you know? Like, you rap me on mic for mic. It's like, I'm, I don't know what he called himself back then. Might even be more G or something else. He might have had another little handle. This is before him and LBC, you know, with the, you know, Light of Shade and all the different people he influenced and produced. He's like, yeah, I get him. And I was like, well, what's up? You think they'll let us rap? <laughs> 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 you know, I'm being nice. Because I don't know, like, how, how he move or whatever. Like, right. I don't know. He kind of comfortable, though. He might. <laughs> and he go, well, I don't know if I'm ready for all that yet. I was like, you think they'll let me get up? He was like, I don't know. I can ask. That's my cousin up there. You know, you put in the Dre. And I'm like, oh, the DJ's your cousin? I was like, oh, all right. All right. I was like, I'll be back. Because <laughs> I know he didn't go up and ask Dre, one. And two, I'm going to get some backup because I'm scared. So right. I go back to the laundromat, try to get AC alone and somebody to come with me. Back then, he was ACE or somebody. Right. Uh, MC Hollywood. He was MC Hollywood. He was MC ACE. ACE. Mm -hmm. And speaking of, uh, uh, of AC, uh, another legendary story is you and Ace running up on Run DMC at the Wendy's. Man, we come in from some places at night. You know, it's a lot of bus work. It's a lot of footwork. And I know we coming back late from some place, and we probably had curfews or something. And I know we was in full B-boy regalia then. We're going southbound on the La Brea, but it's up the hill, going back toward the jungles, right? Just going from rodeo up to Coliseum, and I know we on foot, and I know I'm tired, because you, yeah, you can't really walk mean, with the fat little straps. Walk. <laughs> Man, money we just got off the bus, but probably just coming from like the Belmont Tunnel or something, coming maybe, you know, from that little Fairfax High bus stop or something, or maybe coming from just some place where all the writers and b-boys hang out, and just bailing, strolling. Mm -hmm. And of course, we like, you got some money? I got some money. <laughs> You know, you hungry? I'm hungry. Let's feast. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy's right there. And it's like, there's never no line there at the Wendy's. It's late. So we walk in, but as I'm walking up, I see a, a stretched limousine. You know, nice looking limousine. And I see somebody leg out of the back with the door open. And when I look closer as we're walking up, I notice it's black jeans, black Adidas shell toes with no straps. <laughs> So that's the first thing I see as I'm walking. And then I take a look to my left. Hey, see, huh? You ain't really noticing. I look to my left, show enough. Rest in peace. My bread and butter, my bro. We became friends through the years, too, after all of this. Jam Master J. In full run DMC, get down. Ugh. Mind you, I'm already probably like. You know, I probably might have had me like a, a black leather bomber mm -hmm. with a with a with a, a furry black kango and you know, black down with the buckle, the whole, you know, I'm with the business. <laughs> representing this this B-boy Cali and you know, it's Cali B-boy, you know, LA rapping, you know, LA hip hopping. Fresh, AC fresh. We cazowed up, you know, so you're not gonna tell us nothing. They probably think we from now why or something, right? right. So I'm like, Ace, hey, that's Jam Master J. They inside. Let's get them. <laughs> yeah. Mind you, Let's it's open. Him. There is no one in the Wendy's except for DMC and Run. Wow. And they already at the counter, you know, because it's like a little maze. They ordering their food, right? I'm waiting, me and, me and Ace in line. And I'm like, just as soon as they turn around. So then. You know, we kind of scuffling. Yeah. They finish their food as soon as DMC turn around. What's up with the real B-boy battle? Yeah. I'm like that Adam, me and Ace, like that. <laughs> Just you, you hitting them with the elbows. Pew, pew. <laughs> Nigga. Oh, y'all, y'all, y'all some young rappers, huh? Run DMC. He'll, but, but bust something. Bust something in. Already throwing off. We said battle, though. But we, we didn't press that line because that's running DMC right there. We want to get on. So me and Ace, we start going on one of our routines we got together. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. The MC Aces have just begun in the place to be. Rocking anyone when I DMC or DJ run. It's ACE and microphone mic. A deadly combination whenever we unite with the MC's threat. The best ones yet. The two tough messes of the English alphabet. And when our powers are combined, we call my native first rhyme. At a beat to this rap and it'll blow your mind. Huh. And they go, oh, 
all the people working back on the counter go, oh, everybody <laughs> like, oh, mind you, I'm probably beating at the same time right, right. while we rhyming. So, you know, I'm gonna, you know, find a little wall right there. They go, oh, yo, 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 man. Yo, uh, yeah, man, we, we kick some rhymes with y'all, but we, 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 we running late for this flight, man. And then we like, oh, <laughs> y'all don't want to battle. What's up? Let me get a record deal. And then they like, well, um, yo, get a pen, get a pen. Hey, y'all got a pen at the counter? Jay on the phone right now. He got the phone. Car battery with yeah. curly Q the with big the, the phone yeah. piece. <laughs> What's going on in here? I heard some yelling. <laughs> <laughs> yo, these guns are fly, man. They fly, man. They fresh, yo. Yo, we gonna get back at y'all when we come back to LA, man. Wrote down some little number. Number was probably real. Damn, you know, it was probably nice. real, but it was probably the number to that phone. Right. And you know, them phones wasn't too reliable back then. <laughs> that might have just been their LA phone. We might have called that shit 20 times. They ended up giving y'all love later, though. Oh, absolutely. And we sat down in videos and hung out with them and stuff. And like I said, two steps down in, in, in New York, having good dinners with, with Jay and, and Kedar formally introduced me to him and, mm -hmm. you know, his studio up there in Bronx when I just, you know, rest in peace to that man. You know, that was a positive man. Good man. DMC would hang out with us, too, and let us know when he was coming to town. They wanted to chill with us. We're on DMC, too. Last time I hung out with them was at Belmont Tunnel. That's where we used to do a lot of graffiti art as well. But that was already like way in the 90s, like late 90s. Another cool story. So you knew Tupac a long time. Every time he saw you, what would happen? We'd get into the rhyming. Every time. Every time. No matter Just, what. No matter what, rhyming. Because, you know, I hung with Shock G, shout out Jerry too, and I hung with other people, you know, back back in the day, like, you know, when you're partying or when you're drinking or when you with the girls, whatever. When I pop it, it's just like, because him and Coolio, I used to keep them together because they were both the same way. All just about the rhyming, on site, rhyming. And they're not even friendly. Like, start battling. Like, you might be with your homie, your crew, y'all just, but rhyming. Whether I caught him in the Bay or whether he caught me in LA, whether it was a convention or we just in the streets. You know, sometimes he'll cypher for a minute or sometimes he'll just bust a quick at you at you because he got to do what he's doing as he start bubbling. But I'm talking about mainly like back in the Ahad day. Shout out Adrian Miller. You know, congrats to his thing, you know, uh, Karen, they got that thing out now. But he used to have this company called A-Hat, and they made them hats that look kind of like scarves, or like, but just he was just with the rhyming. You know, he kind of changed his flow through the years. Of course. After he got locked down, he said things that nature had more of a rider flow. At that point, like he riding a horse. You know, <laughs> you make that flow gallop when you're going slow, you know, on the dear mamas and keep your head up. But then when he was active, you know, bomb first, he was like, you know, galloping then, you know, he was like trotting. Well, it was dope because he was comfortable rhyming with me all the time, you know, whenever we busted each other. Um, LL had a couple moments with him too, but LL, like we ciphering. Then LL got to jump on the piano, <laughs> like, <laughs> and then start taking his shirt off and turning it to LL thing. And right. Then, you know. But as he said, that's LL. He, he gonna be the center Back of attention one way or another. <laughs> yeah. And but you know, but, but Pac, you know, I was always with that rhyme. I was just with the cipher and keeping the b boys, b boy shit active. You dig? That was important to me. You know, like whether I got signed or not, to let them know I'm open. I'm not scared to rhyme no more because that was courage too. It took a lot of courage. You know, you got cats thinking that they'll fight, they'll do this, they'll do that. Active rhyming, and then it brings to mind, you know, the rivalry you had with Biggie, which wasn't always a rivalry. Mm -hmm. And I'm proof positive of that because Biggie knew me from rhyming as well. You know, reputation preceded itself when I want to introduce myself to him already. He reminded me of E. Rule, like, you catch mm -hmm. him back in the days before they was on, like, rhyming in the street, walking with somebody right behind them with a boom box, and then two or three other people behind them rolling blunts, and they just mm -hmm. going where they going. So I already knew Biggie when I was in L.Y., especially, you know, coming and going. Like, you know, might catch him, like, off a class in the gates or somewhere in bed style, just walking, like, down the street rhyming, just always rhyming. I'm like, who's that big dude rhyming, talking to Big Gun from Mundias Entertainment? And he like, uh, yeah, that's Biggie, man. He, he the next, man. He dope, man. He dope. Just check him out. It's like, all right, I'm going to check him out. Not too long after that, okay, I hear somebody blowing it up in Bushwick, you know, maybe about five, six months later. You know, I ain't got nothing to do. Let me go down here. Who's over there blowing it up at the record shop? Just like, no, he's just serving everybody. I'm like, all right, let me go over here. I'm going to battle this fool. Yeah, Whatever, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like circa with 93 and something, 94, shortly after we put out the record. Sure enough, as soon as I leave, get there, he's leaving. It's Biggie. He's like, oh, man, I've been blowing it up all day, man. You know? <laughs> go ahead, man. The mic is yours. <laughs> I'm like, oh, he's serving everybody. Where was you at? But, you know, comfortable rhyming and shit. So through the years, you know, I mean, through the months, you know, catch him in the club here, club there, because he got all the girls out there. He got like five, six girlfriends. And the nigga's scared, you 
right now. Like, don't don't let me don't let me know. Like, I'm I'm hitting his. Like, you know, I ain't gonna say dude name to this day. He still might be scared. Wow. But uh, you know, uh, don't be in the club. Like, no, 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 God, like you, no, Michael, no, man, no. You know, reputation precedes itself. So we get the rhyme and drinking. And a couple months maybe after that, they have a seminar out there. And as a car pulls up, and it's crazy, this is in a Volvo, right? It's Destiny's Child before they became Destiny's Child, but it's Beyonce. I had met her one time before, her pop and moms. And it's like maybe three or four of them all just crunched up in this Volvo. Like they're just mm-hmm. like, oh yeah, well, good luck. You know, we should do some work. Everybody in that networking mode. Right. You know, talk to my dad about management, you know, stuff. So I'm like, oh yeah. You know, because we already kind of made our little strike a little bit. So I was already kind of kind of getting to know and starting to bubble a little bit on my own. Go inside this club, and there's a big dude, Matt. Matt, he did a lot of filming and stuff. This other cat, Reggie, is that his name? But I know them. They do film work. And so they're filming. They got the booth set up. They're like, Mike, go ahead and sit in real quick and uh, just start freestyling and doing something. You know, and they, they ask me some questions, and we're being interviewed. So I'm sitting in the booth in the middle of the thing. I'm sitting there, and I'm rapping, blowing up beating on the table, just doing my thing, you know, kicking it, you know, because there's no music playing in the club. It's just setting it up, you know what I mean? It's like early seminar, you know, music seminar type thing. They're filming. I just heard wind of it. So I'm there. They're filming me. Then I see Biggie. Biggie over there leaning against a, a pillar, just like whatever, right? And I guess he probably taking a break from press, work, but he ain't really nobody yet. I'm like, come here, come here, come here. So he come over. Oh, what's going on, God? What you drinking, God? So he give me a drink. See, you remember all this now when people pass away, the subtle moments. He bring the drink, we had the little booth, right? This is a booth, you know, I got my drink, whatever I'm drinking, I'm thinking I'm fresh back then, probably scotch on the rocks or something. <laughs> and he's sitting in, we start freestyling, me and him. And so they filming it and you know, they happy because they know who he is. I'm bringing them in because you know, film people don't know if they can approach certain people. Right. So I'm boom, you're able to film Biggie because of the rap set, me and him, because he know me from rapping, rapping, you right. know? And so they filming, boom, boom, boom. Then who walk in? Tupac. Mm. So of course he's gonna come and sit on this side. Right. And he started rhyming, all three of us rhyming. I think they might have knew each other or might have just been meeting each other, to be perfectly honest. Because when you see at the end of Kevin Fitzgerald's movie, Freestyle the Art of Rhyme, at the very end, they show Pac and Biggie freestyling together in that very same booth. Because Pac already put his record out, and then I had already been filming and freestyling. And then they go, all right, let's just get Pac and Biggie. Then they said, let's just get Biggie, and then let's interview Pop. So they didn't use the one with all three of us for Kevin Fitzgerald's, but he said he's on the lookout for that footage as we speak, because that's important to me, just to make sure I'm not crazy. Or they, <laughs> or they just had the, the light on, but wasn't really recording. <laughs> but, you know, and the thing is, I knew who to do, who kind of knew, and I even talked to him, the big dude, Matt. Film dude, he got all kind of footage and stuff, all kind of stuff through the years. He's incredible, man. He's licensing all that slice it now, living good. Good on him. Congratulations. But I would just love to see it just for that nostalgia as such. But those were kind of like the ways when you would see Pac or you would see Biggie keeping it active with the rhyming, or when you'd see Coolio, he was open too and it brought like legitimacy to the A&R people and the white folks and people they didn't know if we're just some street performers trying to crashed a party, you know. It, it, it gave a nigga stamped in a legitimacy back then. I realized they artists, like just business or actors or, or producers, directors and, and pillars in the community. We're talking about people that, that are prophetic in their movement, saved lives and in the process, so. I want to start talking about the Freestyle Fellowship. Oh. Absolutely. Just even when you ask about yeah, it, bro, man. it summons them. It's like it the Batman does. song, bro. Just speaking the Freestyle Fellowship might create a new record, might create a new tour and movement, I'm bro. Gonna, I'm going to say it every day then. Oh, <laughs> man. For real, fully formed individuals mm-hmm. that, like, fully formed rap monsters man. that congeal to make this thing. My, my Fellowship album would be like with Beats by Kilu and Pun and and peace on board fully, mm-hmm. you know, and each person coming to the table with their best material and then writing us in and mm-hmm. musician embellishments and, you know, future beat vibes and, you know, just the different cuts we work with through the years, just bringing them back around from JMD to Ola to Mathematics and even some of the newer cats, but not too schizophrenic, but just wit, 
not even so much hot dogging and, and rap razzmatazz and, and rapid fire as much as just unique styles and patterns with the right. chops, like unique Morse coding and, and, and forward moving ways and new effects. I think that would be fly. So I, I talked to MERS, uh, Mers a, few, a few months ago. Brother and MERS. One Legends, of the one of the crew. exactly one of one of the funnest things I did in that interview was I was like, "Yo, quicker than is even fair." I want you to tell the story of the Living Legends, but I want to put you on the same spot in a minute. What's the story of Freestyle Fellowship? Conglomeration of rapping entities and DJ that met early on, starting with Mike and AC, with convolutions of music and fusion, became drill masters of style and vernacular. Rap virtuoso, worldwide known seeding the underground hip hop movement and redefining the term freestyle as improvisational rap. I love that. I love that. I love that for a lot of reasons. Nice. But, but one of the most exciting is that actually, my next question to you was about you all defining the term freestyle. That's a thing that's in the book that I never even thought about. Yeah, because back in the day when you were hearing the word freestyle when it pertained to rap, you might have heard Karis once say, you know, cruising down the street with my freestyle fix. Mm -hmm. He wasn't talking about rapping, he was talking about a bike. Right. Well, you hear Rakim go, a, a, a purified freestyle, you know, which is more of a written rhyme, obviously, that was not any particular subject, which I always thought was wild style in that case. But back in then, days like different parts of New York had different terms. You had like off the top, off the top of the head, or back then before that, it was like sky rap. I remember hearing sky rap. <laughs> you don't sound like you love that term. <laughs> no, but I remember sky rap though. That was like what they was trying to say, but didn't really know the term right. like spontaneity or spontaneous or improvisation or rapping about what's around you or, or, or subject matter or different things of that nature, approaching it as such. It, it, to them, it was just rapping in the street without no beat or maybe with a beatbox at best. But no, nah, that was like flexing and busting, if I remember. And like, that was like. You know, when the term flow came, it was just your, your flow had a flow and a pause, whatever the Rakim size, right? But then you like, nah, freestyle, you know, because I remember being young, like, nah, freestyle was like on the skateboards and on the bikes when that's the part where you don't have to complete a course. You do your own thing, whatever comes to mind. Right. You know, and, you, and you're making it up as you go along. And that might have even came from, you know, my parents being jazz musicians, stuff like that, and imp improvising solo type mentality you know, that was instilled in me. And plus just what I was doing naturally when I ran out of rhymes, mm. you dig? Like I could keep rhyming, I could just use the rap like a language, say what I want to say. And like, we, we used to bag anyway, so just make your bags rhyme, mm. you know? And that's how I used to crush too. But now going to New York and, and realize, okay, they talking about freestyling like this and that, but the term freestyle, wasn't even being used that much back then when, when people were rap. They would be like, sp they wouldn't even say spit, it'd be like, bust something. That was more the universal term of rapping back then. You, you gonna bust something? You gonna bust? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's kind of a weird question so you gonna, to ask. Right? You know, like you gonna dump? Like, <laughs> man, <laughs> we putting in work like we rapping. <laughs> hey, no, for them to freestyle when I start going through the years, late 80s, they're like, uh, oh, we was just freestyling, you know? out there just hanging out, rhyming, you know, and it's like, it's somewhere like some doo-bop or something. Like, y'all out there like the old cats in the 60s, you know, mm -hmm. corners. I'm with that, with whatever, you know, because we were cypher anyway. I was like, no, nah, that needs to be a term for that because I'm hearing too many different terms. And so I said, well, I thought freestyle would be a good term. Back then, the freestyle wasn't even developed in and of itself in that uniform consciousness. It, it, was, it was still a challenge, not just for people that learn how to rap and the challenge of getting to that level, us too, and there were drills and things of that nature. And I remember the quandary with Ace on, should we name our crew heavyweights and the Umbrella Crew Freestyle Fellowship or make the Umbrella Crew heavyweights and Freestyle Fellowship. And that was just at the time, that's how you got the heavyweight rounds, the heavyweights of good life. You know, heavyweight round two, round three, round four, whatever, but round five or six, I don't know. All these compilation records. It was like, well, we don't want to be a posse, too many posses. You know, back then it was posses and tribes. And I was already digging in the books and, and my mom was deep in the self-realization fellowship and, you know, fellowship on the churches and stuff, even though people weren't church and back then. Fellowship. Fellowship. And I thought it was kind of like lolly a little bit, like freestyle, like fellowship. I'm like, lolly, like hold your tongue and say it. You know, freestyle fell on shit. You know, like, <laughs> I'm like, oh no, like, 
But no, it kind of had a ring though too, because yeah. it, it created like a, a spiritual level of freestyling, and, and it created a, a upper level, mm -hmm. and in and of itself a, a tier of sorts. Or not even just the thought of ascended masterhood, so far as rap goes. Right. And freestyle fellowship, self realization, you know, freestyle fellowship. So right there in front of my mom's apartment, apartment four, I'm sitting on a little bar right there, and Ace right there. We like, yeah, we are gonna call it freestyle fellowship. Yeah, but the improvisational rap, I think. It should be called freestyle, for lack of a better term. At the and time. I think that caught on, and I, I don't know, it just it, it hit me to read that because when it comes to rap, like you don't often think about somebody had to decide this was the term for this. Like you don't yeah, think you about have flow. That. You know what I'm saying? I'd say Rakim put out flow all day for me, and having that platform, you know, was another thing. But in the streets and me being, you know, by coastal, and I started meeting dope MCs back then too. What was that? Uh, Professor Pete and Paul. Uh, again, Don Jaguar and, and my different connects of people back and forth, East and West Coast, Sayel, Devon and them, you know, the guards and stuff. So they understood where we was at and was building. They overstood where we was at as well. And, and some of the Moore rappers, I remember Adam the Moore and stuff, and uh, QT. There were MCs there, this by the time LL's out, making this beats and rhyming with I need a beat. You know, computerized in the engineer's eyes has to be very acute education level high. You know, like we was all with that. We was with that Ultra Mag getting them red alert tapes and stuff. Communicating with people up north and down south, just the MCs that was with that that higher grade, you know, high art, you know, lyricism. We we geeked off that, you know, be it pattern matching or subject matching or writing the rhythm or subject matter. Because in the early '90s, all of that was real new. Indeed. And it's hard to think about that unless you really like go back and look at the context, right? Like you go back and you hear one DMC and then you you hear, oh, okay, these are dope, but yeah, they're doing like a kind of like simpler pattern. And you don't, you know, you don't seem you don't feel like that at the time because they're coming off the backs of Melly Mel, and it's a little more complicated than that. But then Ultra Mag comes and says, you use the simple back and forth, the same old rhythm that the baby could pick up and join right with him. And it's like, oh, they just clowned the whole Cause they're generation. Killing it yeah. With the pattern matching, they killing it. Cool kids. They use the simple back and forth, the same old rhythm that a baby can pick up and join right with them, but the rhymes are pathetic. So there's so many moments in the book where you walking up on somebody and what's up with that real B-boy battle? I was active back then. I had <laughs> lyrics. I was with that because... It's bold new ground, whether you freestyle or battling, but it's a multifaceted jewel. So, you know, back then it was maybe about four or five facets. You had your rapping written words, uh, whatever you're, you're recording on your headphones or microphone or whatever it is, rapping through the headphones, plugged in the mic jack, or battling in the street for cred or for money or for, you know each other, but you're mock battling so you both could make money. You know, that's a street performer kind of stick. But it wasn't so much about sessioning or ciphering, or I mean, it was ciphering, but not so much kicking rhymes or freestyling or just the more different aspects of rapper entrepreneurship or networking or different things that come with it, shows and performing and tours. That wasn't really on the bars back then. You know, we didn't have them bars. My first tour, I think I did when I was like maybe 19, 20, and I did a 40 city tour that was in when, America. Is that when you wrote? for Whitney Houston and you did stuff with the Whalers yeah, and you did yeah. this nationwide tour. Mm -hmm. That was incredible. That was that good rapper money back then. Limousines, airplanes, treated like a star. Carmen Carter, she could sing strong, but certain venues, I think, intimidated her because as R&B was changing and hip hop was changing, it was blending together. You know, you had Kumo D and all that kind of stuff coming together, you know, where it'd be like, hey, like me now, where mm -hmm. it was all coming together. So. She didn't know if it was a rap crowd or not. I'm just like, no, it's a bunch of black people. The more, the merrier. <laughs> so I'm coming out. I got my locks hanging out, my big hat, kind of MTV-ish with the long coat. But, you know, our style underground was to cut off khakis and, and the Converse and, and the jerseys, you know, with your number on it, whatever. We were rocking it like that with the red, black, and green, or red, gold, and green uh, wristbands. And, you know, we was wild with it and, you know, ill, like Divine Styler kind of like, you know, Soul Brothers. Turning that poison into medicine. You know, I come out, I know I look a little funny. I know I don't look the part because I'm already flexing my style different. Head full of locks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back then, you know, not too many, rock a muffin a little bit, but not too many people know what that, that move is like on stage like that. Uh, highlight was the pin relays. Uh, easy, like 5,000, 6,000 people. Crowd opening up for LL, EPMD, BDP. Back when BDP had... Um, the whole crew, Miss Melody and the girl, the other girl, Harmony. EPMD, they have a scratch. 
We all backstage chilling, you know, but Carmen, she's shy because she's singing, you know, but it's like nobody really singing. I'm like, well, no, I'm Miss Melly, you know, Harmony over here, you know, like, they got, you know, we're doing that. I'm opening up. Mm -hmm. This is the hardest part. And they're feverishly waiting for music to start. No respect in the East Coast. It's the pin relays when all the different track meets come together and shit. And uh, so you got people from the tri-state area all around coming through, converging, all the colleges coming through. It's like they're freak Nick, you know, so it's just... I don't think they were charging. I don't think they could keep the people out. Right. But it's completely packed, this little arena, whatever. We was in this, not arena, uh, theater, stadium kind of deal. Not stadium, theater. Big, big shit for a little guy like me. Easily uh, multiple thousands of people out. From front all the way back. And I'm like, oh, man, I got to go on first. <laughs> we didn't have flash drives or shit like that. Right. You had to have your record cued, whatever it is you wanted to do. And I already told them, cue this up, funky drummer. I already knew it because I read the room and read the crowd. I'm like, I'm not going to do my song with her. I'm not going to do that. I told her, just stay back on this one. I'm opening it up. And then once I open them up, then you can come out and, and do your chorus part. And then I'm going to just do the rap version of the song. I cued the DJ. I said, I'm going to hold my hand up. But as soon as I drop my hand, you drop the beat. Mm -hmm. How much gambling is going into that? I mean, back in like 1990. This is pretty risky. And the DJ don't know you from Adam. You're not a PMD. You're not BDP. So you ain't not... even really got to do it how you want if he, he don't want to. He's probably feeling his chest. Like, <laughs> I'm opening up for them too. Right. And this crowd, he don't want to fuck up. And I told him what I'm going to rap, what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to hold my hand up and drop it. And when I drop it, that's when you drop the beat. Because I'm going for the effect of rapping a cappella, mm -hmm. which I did. I come out, something. Whatever I was saying, what was I was saying? Uh, do gal, do gal, do gal, loud, loud, get off mine, get off mine. Tick, 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 boom, va boom, kaboom, a mushroom cloud of doom, taps displayed, rappers laid to rest in pieces and particles. They release a new article on the ministers and it's convicted me as a grimace. Hmm, days I flew around, they do, when I sparked a whole, come, do, I have a cap, you get the mat, I hit my gat, mic, right? The crowd going, ah, <laughs> you was on the roll like a ball, you ball, you became a pin, falling in the end, strike. And then in the beat went, boom, boom, and the crowd's like, oh, because first when I came out, they laughing at me. Uh. That's another thing. I don't even know if they got that in the book. I was the one they laughed at, bro. Like, they laughing at your weird style with the cut off khakis <laughs> with the strings hanging, like half urban hippie, ragamuffin, right? But then I'm flowing, mm -hmm. and they laughing, kind of almost booing. But I'm on beat, but he luckily dropped that shit perfect. right on perfect down beat one any time, and the crowd just exploded. One thing that the book ends up touching on is that you've lost a lot of recorded music. Even when you get the hard drive out, the smashed computer because somebody was mad. Uh, the dats, the cassettes, you know, moving around, you know, different places, stuff just getting lost. Oh, my bro just got locked up, man. Keep your head up, bro. And he just acquired all the dats that I had from back in the early Fat Jack days, back in the early Shout out to Fat Jack. demos I did with different artists from here to New York from mm -hmm. like 90 on up that I had on dats like 92, 93, little demos and stuff I did for different people. Was, even though I had my deal, let's say when I was in New York circa certain years, I, you know, a lot of demos to help record for other people and stuff. I'm sure that they would like some, to hear some of those old squeaky voice tunes when they were young. I remember one time going to Cypress Hill's very first show listening party, and it was in Hollywood, and I was just transporting all my rhymes. It was my first time losing my first batch of rhymes. And a backpack with my little drum, because I was learning how to play the drums then, and a little beat machine. And, and I remember Paul Stewart said, yo, you can put the bag back here. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to be on the wheels all night. At the end of the show, I'm like, yo, it's my backpack. What backpack? Uh... <laughs> yo, I thought you'd been grabbed that. What are you talking about? Hey. Yo, gone. <laughs> Then another time, big garbage bag full of rhymes I had. Moving somewhere in Cartage, probably from New York back to LA. Everything but the garbage bag of rhymes, because they thought it was garbage. The ones we really want, we rarely get. What we met together with can never cover the regret of who we lose or never left. It may be harder to forget what we may not have had, and yet we carry on without the threat. It could be life or could be death. Time is pressing feelings, and if not, me having lifetime is running out. Ain't no one keeping me from getting mine. And body sounding all my faculties. Even though I'm not platinum or rich, the legacy is rich. That's a quote Indeed. from the book. 
all of us. People come to be like, man, you know, I heard some song you were singing or rapping on or whatever. You know, I was in a dark place. You know, it kind of helped turn me around. And I'm like, wow, see, it's bigger than me. Or somebody's like, you know, I named my kid after you or something. You know, that it's like, oh, I got, did a swimmer get loose? <laughs> 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 no, nah, but it's more like, you know, you have kids out here, not only kids in, in style, but people that, you know, that hold you. I'm like, okay, you're just old. But like, no, nah, you're young old. Just like I was young, young, young old. Because mm -hmm. I was still trying to get on. You know, I remember DJ Paradise, Curtis Harmon, um, the, the West Coast early DJs, AD Vance, using my mom's mascara to make a fake mustache so I could sneak into the fever wow. um, at like 12 and 13 just to hear the music. I was raised in foster homes, so I'm moving in with my mom when I turned nine. So I used to sleep in a, in a kick drum. So the music was always there and always going on and stuff. I remember my dad with the cloud bass trying to teach me time when I'm mm. like two years old. And then when I would miss time, he would use the cloud bass to... <laughs> you <a little> <laughs> you're, gonna, you're, you're gonna learn time. And... Uh, that's all it was, but I always wanted to skew the time. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's why I was always going on beat off beat. Because I knew there was more to time and music than what was being displayed in music. For rappers especially. In the book, when you're talking about making records in New York. It's really gone into detail in the book a few times, the relationship between you and Kwali and how much he admired you. That really comes up a lot in the book. It's, I won't say shocking, but it's like, damn, you just think about to go from that to like, you know, y'all being at each other's throats, you know what I'm saying, lyrically and otherwise. Um, like, what do you think happened? You know what I'm saying? Like, if you look at some, like a relationship that seemed like it was once that close to get so far away like what do you what do you think happened there it's a loss like when you're talking earlier about lost material but there was a loss and and the loss is beyond me to know what it is and there might be maybe somebody lost their mind a bit you know because you don't know how other people eat you don't know how other people what, what's in their reality what they're dealing with especially if you're not on the daily anymore you're just doing them levels how you know them and how they know you and how you should know of them a bit in the public eye, but I don't celebrity worship. I don't idol worship. I don't fanboy out on nobody. So I don't know all your songs. I don't know this or that. I'll catch this or catch that when I think about you. I'll just call you, be like, what's up? When well, I'm in town, go to your house, we hang out, whatever. You know, roll up the blunts, you know, the Duchess or something, you know, catch up on family, catch up on stuff. It's just, you know, more like that. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not nah, quiet, man. Um, young bro, you meet him, you know, maybe 17. Short locks, because I'm going to buy one of 64 ounces from the liquor store. <laughs> and I beat this guy, Omari, and he's got the go Goryo, and he's got the short twist. He's like, yo, God, you know, and I, I didn't roll with, like, bodyguards, but there was always people, like, with me. Might have been Mike Knight. Back then, he was a manager, but manager of uh, Eric Badu and The Roots. And this guy goes, yo, God, you got to meet this kid, man. He's just an incredible Freestyle Fellowship fan. And I'm like, well, you know, I got to go back. You know, we got a sound check. We got to, you know... Now you gotta meet him. He's right across the street. Come on, man. You don't have no time for your fans. You don't have no time. Like, so I'm like, all right, walk over here real quick and meet him. You know, we'll blaze some boom. I was like, well, I don't know if I'm ready to blaze a boom like that, but you know, all right. And so me, Salim, Mike, now we go over there, knock on the door. Here's Talib opening the door. Hey, white guy, you know what's up? You know, good kid. I'm like, all right, cool, good kid. I'm like, all right, come on, let's go in here. Let's fire down, fire down. Rapping, rhyming, see level he's at, he's at, you know, and his friend stuff. I'm like, okay, yeah, they're, they're, they're getting it, they're getting it, you know. But, you know, we started, started you know, just freestyle, just the more interpersonal, because they don't know how you rap or whatever, other than the records or whatever, they might have heard you doing an interview on the radio. But on through the years, you know, you got to deal, you know, I mean, everybody, we're all chilling and shit. Some people already knew, and I'm bringing them around too, like, you know, East Orange, I'm already well aware of the Fugees, because I met them through uh, Brian Cross. So, you know, it'd be like Lauren Hill, me, Dante, that's Yasin Bey, uh, Forte, uh, no, Park MCs, because, you know, I rapped a lot in the parks in L.A., so, and, and of course, in New York, you know, wow, we Park MCs, we're all rapping, Ghost, IG Off, you know, Talib, Divine, Makiba, Prodigal, a blend of, like, mainly Talib's friends and some of the Park MCs and some of the people I knew all blend together, hanging out, and rapping and going around checking, you know, different clubs and scenes and just, you know, ways and actions, lands, uh, rallies and such. Demos, recording, uh, different producers, you know, step. And this is before heads, because, you know, Omari Natty, so heads gone, Natty, Natty, uh, 
high tech, you know, shout out all the cats, man, just profound artists. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and Talib, just good all around positive cat. Him and this bro, you know, hip hop, whatever. And, you know, uh, we end up, you know, staying together a little bit here, a little bit there, you know, working things out like that. You know, nothing but love. So uh, that's where we're all moving up, doing our different things, whatever. You know, nothing but pride and respect. I came back to LA at a, at a moment when everything was just starting to fully flower mm -hmm. on the East Coast that I'd been, you know, helping with everyone else, all working together, uh, germinate. And, and so I was just glad to, okay, me leaving didn't make anything go down. Everything just kept going that was going like up. right in front of that lyricist lounge, mm -hmm. raucous kind of era. It was Ellen, like right yep, there. Yep, right all in the, in the cuts from the beginning of that. I had my West Coast Good Life, I had my East Coast lyricist lounge that was bubbling and everything. So I was like, cool. You know, again, shout out Blue, shout out D. So, on through the years, you know, more support this, that. I remember uh, different tours I'm in, you know, I'm like trying to dip in on them when I'm on the East Coast. Uh, one time, back in like 08, uh, he said to my Twitter, you know, for me. He's like, you don't fuck with Twitter? He's like, yeah, he said to my Twitter for me. So I'm like, okay, cool. You know, we're having good beers and back on tour, rolling around through the years. I catch a show or I catch one of their shows to bring me on stage. We blow up, whatever, and have fun. You know, and he's always reminded me of some of the old songs and demos that I had that obviously I might have lost, like good music and other things. You know, I was dope, just that shh. Yeah. So you want to redo it, you know, because you didn't ground the mixer <laughs> when you're doing your samples and shit. But I had the nice hot rotted MP back then. So on through the years, you know, you might catch a trial of tribulation here, you know, with somebody online, you come to the defense, whether it's some Nazi banging on them. Mm -hmm. Or even if one of my homies, let's say my bro Will Blast, might have been like, yo, boom, 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 because I didn't know all the background information on how different groups and loyalties would shift and move depending on celebrity worship and how some of my close loved ones like Will Blast grew up in Malcolm Jamal Warner's building across the alley from me. We all grew up together. So heads go back, you know, like bread and butter, grits and cornbread, you know. With that said, you know, I didn't know they was going there. So by the time, let's say I did the feature for Talib. Born this way, Capricorn LA, on the day of January 15th, thought the king his dream torn from a warm moon form from the clay. Existing, shifting from the essence, uplifting, and the presence just drifting, gifting for this mortal core with mystic lessons from the sage. It comes out, and interesting enough, when it comes out, everyone's happy. You know, I'm happy because, you know, like, hey, finally, me and my guy gets to do it in a more professional arena. Well, here comes Will Blast coming in, like, whoa, 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 finally, after 25 years, whoa, whoa, whoa and just banging on him. I'm like, hey man, you're my bro, he's my bro. Like, whoa. Telling Will Blast like, ease out, and, and Talib ease out, and so they both on my account ease out. So I do the verse, whatever. No coin then, you know, but I'm like, all right, cool, whatever, you know, just association with him, maybe it's gonna be some maybe far reaching. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? The album's got all kinds of stars on the album, so cool. And title track, hey, and plus that's my bro, you know, why not, he do it for me. The record came out, then a couple years after that, we do the video, whatever, and then whatever, it's on his record. I'm going to Ross G's memorial, and that's at Lamert on the corner. We gather for each other. And Jametta Rose is asking me to do something. I think she wanted me to hand whistle, like. <laughs> like something in beatbox or something while she sang something. Because we're just there, like, yeah. you know, while in shock. I just saw Ross G a couple weeks before that. Afrodelic, future relic. That was going to be our, our get down, like a theme for what we were going to do together. Oh man, shout out to his brother, rest in peace, Ross G. So we there, right? And my phone ring. And mind you, I go over there. I'm with like LA Cool, some of the other people there. I think Joseph Lineberg pulling up different people. You know, I ain't seen him for a while, and I want to peace out with him as well. And my phone ring. And then when my phone ring, it's kind of loud out there. So I walk into Ben's office, you know, into chaos. I'm going, hello, hello, what's up? Oh, is that motherfucker with you? It's a motherfucker with you, I'm like. I'm looking at the phone, it says Talib on the phone. Mm. And I'm like, bro, bro, what's going on? You all right? And as I'm going, you all right? What's going on? And I hear Talib like, is that nigga with you? And then I hear LA Cool walking up to me and go, is that that bitch ass nigga on the phone? Damn, and okay. I'm like, whoa, what's going on? Right. I'm at a, whoa. Well, this is all happening while you at Rise G's Mikey, memorial. I'm, God is greatest, I'm telling you. I'm like, wait, y'all going at it? Wait, wait y'all need to talk, huh? And then he like, Fuck that bitch, that's I ain't nothing to say to him. And then Talib, like, y'all want to talk? And then Talib just hangs up on me. I'm like, whoa, whoa what's going on? Cool, go, oh man, this nigga think I don't know you or something. This nigga been snapping at me. Whoa, 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 nigga, look, look, I just sent a picture of you and me here. And he showed me the picture. I'm like, so you taking a picture of yourself with me <laughs> at the memorial? Yeah, to show this 
other brother that we do fuck around with each other because we kick it all the time, normal. And so I'm getting it, but as it's hitting me though, I'm not knowing that it might be also antagonizing, but me knowing cool, I don't know what, is he stirring something up or is it, but actually he's been cool. Mm. I didn't know Talib done went and changed his personality and became more of an aggro type of person. You dig, or less, because I guess he gets attacked so much by so many different people. He don't know who coming at him. If you ain't with him, you against him. I don't know. Like, just, I'm trying to think about my bro and how he changed. Always mm -hmm. humble and cool, but like, just way, way, like, narcissistically negative, at least in them plays. And I know cool, he's natural narcissist and such, but you always come from a good place. And I know Talib, dude, like, like, this don't make no sense. This has got to be squashed easy. So I'm trying to enjoy the memorial. He keep calling me, and then, Cool, and I'm just like, man, well, cool this shit out, we'll talk about it later after the thing. So then after the thing, I'm talking with Cool, and he's showing me, like, look, some troll dragged him in about some bullshit. I'm telling him, hey, I ain't got no problems with you, leave me out of it. And then I showed a picture, of all of us kicking it together, because I would take Cool with me and Mr. CR to shows when Talib would call me out. So that's you know, cool, CR, yeah. He, yeah, he'd be like, yo, you, we, we coming in town, why don't you come backstage and we'll get on stage with us. All right, cool, bring a couple people, cool. That's who I'm gonna bring, if not AC or Jupe or somebody. Or pun or somebody like I'm bringing LA Cooler, or what you know, and then my good life was a project Williams right. come on through, you know, maybe they get somebody like whatever network established as such. So Cool sends a picture to Talib online, and this is all in Twitter, mind mm -hmm, you. Mm -hmm. Same Twitter that Talib set up for me. <laughs> uh, too many callbacks, right? <laughs> so then he shows a picture of me, Talib, it's Juju, my good bro Juju, love Juju. Uh one of Talib's bro, that's my bro too, though, like. Juju, uh, uh, Miss CR, just different Aguilas in the picture, like just us. Yeah. And then Talib and Sergeant went, like, oh, oh, my bad. Oh, oh, we do go back. Well, well fuck this troll nigga, whatever. Are you having me? Uh, uh, well, most of the people back there, they got my back over your back. That's what Talib say. Oh. Dun, 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 finger wrestling. Dun, 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 dun. Oh my God. So it's just getting, so, it's so getting dirtier. Then, so then I, I chime in and I go, this, you know, and right after Nipsey passed away. So I'm just like, in the spirit of Nipsey, you know, both of y'all, my good bros, like, we, you know, I, I post a picture of the black man oath, you know, not going to hurt each other, promise not to, you know, harm you, just want to see you excel, however, however it's worded, right? Right. And then Talib started hitting me on the, on the private, like, on my private text, like, oh, you, you put your head in the sand and you just want peace, but there ain't no peace without justice. And I'm like, well, what's justice? I mean, justice is peace. Peace is better than war. What are you talking about? And I'm like, don't try to drag me into the dark side because he's going, like, going, like, like intense, like, just ting, ting, ting. Like, oh, you guys are threatening my family. You gotta, I'm like, man, this, you sure it's not just trash talk? I mean, like, hmm. you know, you got to like, nobody going to do nothing to you, do Like, ting, ting, ting. well, if you don't publicly sever ties with L.A. Cool and all rapists, misogynists, homophobes, and say their name, I'm not ever fucking with you again, and I'm going to start dragging you too. And I'm like, what? I'm like, I can't play with this bitch shit. I'm a rider. This is a bitch shit. And you're like, what the fuck? Nigga? You ain't trying to sit down. They're like, well, I'm like, what the fuck is this tenderness? <laughs> like, what the fuck? And I'm like, he don't know how we move. Like, nigga, you ain't like, like, man, no, I don't, you don't know I'm an idol worship. No, no, bro. Me and him go back even before you, bro. Like, no, no. I already said, like, no. So I just silence on the air. So you dragging me from tw Twitter, dragging. You got a millionaire bro who all you did was try to do his demos and take him to his first radio shows and feed nigga, look out for the nigga and forgive him. When niggas want to really get at him behind some other street business and other things, you know, you saved the nigga like, and he, he at you like that, dragging your name, million followers, million dollars, that's thank you. And your nigga cool just got smacked three times, four, five times from some niggas from the jungles. Mind you that. So all of that poly and all that kind of wild ways, I'm just like, wait, there's too much devil being made right now. I'm just going to send love to it. It's all love. Let's just keep the love going. So I set it up for them to talk on the phone. They didn't want to talk. Set it up for them to meet. They didn't want to meet. By then, cool, you know, and I had enough of this motherfucker. And, you know, when, when, when you know, they want to dance, whatever. And then I got the Muslims, you know, all, you know, God is great. So I'm hitting me up. Oh, there's a billion Muslims behind Tyler. Let me get death threats and all this stuff. Like, whoa. whoa. So I'm like, oh man, this is some purified tenderness. I don't fear nobody but God, so whatever. Then this motherfucker start dragging it over to Facebook and dragging all the platforms. And I'm like, oh man, really? So by then, Kool and hit him with a with a two piece and a and a biscuit, you know, 
with the disc records and the videos because he know how to do videos and shit. And he's starting his own genre where it's like the cheesy looking, well, not cheesy, but kind of like- Low, the low budget yeah, shooting. Am- yeah. yeah, battle video, battle video, like amateurs, but, but letting them have it. Obnoxiousness, mm-hmm. returning that obnoxiousness and killing. If I'm riding, we cool, because I'm like, wait, then the world tried, they tried to kill my bro, and then now the millionaire niggas is trying to, man, so cool, like, man, we're going we gonna to eat off this. We're going to handle this. We're going to handle this mic for real. And I'm noticing only a few of the bloatians are standing up. Only a few of the good lifers are standing up. A lot of people just still celebrity worshiping. But I'm like, hold on, dude. I know it's all love, but I can't let this dude just come. So then I just did something super veiled where only he would know if he even heard it. But I'm not on the radar like that. So anyway, I just do the little song. But, you know, just kind of just smelling it. You know, cool did, did too. I just did it. But nobody cool didn't even know I did it till after I did it. And it was just, you know a song with a chorus that I took from 1984 mm. with the MC Aces. One minute you're my friend, the next minute you're not. It's something I remember, but I guess you forgot that I was the one that gets you out of a jam. But when there was a crowd, you don't know who I am. So already in my mind, I'm just keeping it hip hop. I'm not making double with the hands. I'm not making double with the guns, whatever. You know I mean? I got friends with boxing rings, all that little shit. We can work it out. Like I said, Herb Dean, we hook it up. Nice, pay-per-view, <laughs> Pay- pay-per-view. You know, that's about middle-aged niggas out there chunking. You know, lining up, catch a fade, here we go. But then uh, if he need that, he need that. But I'm just saying, you know, I'm like, I'm, I need that with the hip hop. Mm-hmm. I'm just gonna keep it hip hop and eat. Cause I already know how Tali is. I'm like, you really pulling me in with that negative shit, bro. And I have nothing but love for you. Right. Nothing but love. Like that, that, that was like the little tenderness. But then somebody said he got it out of him and said he said it hurt his feelings, whatever, you know. But anyway, him and Coog on that. So then he said some, some, some back and forth. But I'm, I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look one time. And so one time I chose to look, and it was maybe 35, 40 comments of something he had pushed on Facebook. Because mind you, saying Project Bloats, trash, all trash, trash, trash. By the end, I think two Mex had already put out a disc record at him because I guess people feel like I'm above the fray. I'm like, no, nah, I'm already in there too. I'm reading all the comments. I'm like, okay, you know, you know if you look at these comments, you just gotta face the music. I gotta like. 40 comments, 38, 39 of them was all supporting me on his shit. And only one or two was supporting him. And people took the time to dig and to find the thread and everything and how it went down. And it's just like, foul, you dig? So by then, I'm like, all right, well, hopefully it should just die down, whatever. I mean, I'll poly it up later, a little trash talk, a couple of disc records, whatever. And I love the guy. I know they got love for me and shit. But if they don't, maybe that's how life is, mm. you know? But I'm not going to harbor bitterness. So whenever I think about that file shot, I just send love to it, picture the love coming back. That way I, the bitterness don't, you know, affect me like that. But so then I'm like, all right, shh, shh. but he's still pumping it, still at me, at me, at me, at me, at me. So I'm just like, shh. Then finally, here goes somebody calling me, man, you ain't, man, this dude done dissed you, man. And he put out a video, dude. I'm like, well, he took the time to put out a record to diss me. No, he dissed you, ain't cool, but like he dissed me. And by then I found out, wait, you got beef with Dante and Main Flow from Mood? Our old crews, like, we all hung out. Wait, you got, he, wait, Divine talking about you don't really fuck with you? Like, like wait a minute, what's happening? Coming out the woodworks, I'm hearing, you know, uh, other fools, what is it, Ill Bill, somebody uh, whooped on them and served them, one of them rappers, uh, just, rappers just getting at them. I'm like, oh man, they eating you up too out here? Hold on, but you wanna get at me. Not only did he do a record with Diamond D, who I love. Shout out to Diamond. Yeah. Fake a lot for Diamond D specifically. Right. Now you was hating money, keep the same energy. Same energy. And it was tragic how these men spill their guts in my lane. They just bugs on the windshield. Black. Black. Shout out Diamond D. You know, don't weaponize the, the pillars in the hip hop community. And I bet Diamond D might not even know until after. That's how shysty that was. I know he got respect for the fellowship. I know he got respect for the LA underground. Anyway, but then the video got pictures of me in it from the video I did with him on his song. You ain't nothing but a succubus. I say your name if niggas knew who the fuck you was. I see you roll with a nigga I used to fuck with. So to whom it may concern? Yep. You went from we will not tolerate the duck lips. Seem like to me you tolerate a bunch of fuck shit. I put you on my album because of for the culture. But when it's time to hold me down, you prove you for the vulture. And then it made click with me. Last time we left it off, he was like, you just another motherfucker I shouldn't have had on my album. And I'm like, oh, wow, wow. That's hingeable. You know, catching with your mouth open went off that one. But nah, it's all love though. You know, just keeping the hip hop. So once I saw all that, of course, you know, it gets political then. Yeah, yeah. It's off drip. I'm like, you know, the lyric. But then they like, well, you gotta get them. So I'm just barring out. I look up, 
First night, I might have wrote 400 bars. Whoa. Second night, 400 bars, Whoa. pages. Shit. I had about, a, man, easily about 800 bars where it's just like lines. Uh, in a personal, this, I wrote like three, four songs. Me and Coop got three, four songs, two, three songs, a half many songs for backup just in case, you know. Just there's, one, some, there's some more salvos or preemptive. I mean, we, we got more nails for that box. But, you know, I'm not trying to rebuild my career off that bullshit or nothing. You know, I mean, that's coattailing. I saw that video, I said, well, fuck it. How am I get this dude? Because they're already on my neck now. You got to do something, Mike. No, but they like, you know, Mike, you got this. You can handle this. You know, and Cool already gave him a two-piece. Might even dropped another one on him. I was like, nah, me and Cool, we're going to do one together. Since you want to pull me in that. But I was like, I got to dig deep. So I'm going through the little bars and all these pages. I said, OK, how am I going to put it together to beat wise? So I was hip to James Reese Europe. I've been celebrating him the last few years as one of the first rappers, or at least first, you know, blacks in music. He ran the 369 Infantry of the Hellfighters, and they were into the early ragtime jazz. And I just remembered, OK, 100 years back, let me take it back. Let me go deep. Because this dude know I fucks with archaic science, and megalithic structures, and things of that nature. And this diss video that he did for Diamond D, he ever so slightly popped in. That's why it's hip hop and it's cute to me. I love it. You know what I mean? I hope we patch it up today, whatever the fuck. I hope it don't get too crazy. But right now, I gotta eat. Uh, <laughs> yeah. In a microsecond of a frame, he throws in some megalithic structure kind of get down. Come on, because, like, you know, because he you know I fucked with the sign. I fucked with everything. He worked in Cuba books. You know what I mean? You know, yeah. I used to buy all the books. Shit. You know, you know, I've been reading and building since the 80s, though. You know, like, I was like, oh. Boom, boom. Like, that was the uppercut. Boom. Then I'm like, well, fuck it. I got to make sure that I, I go back. So I'm like, OK, let me go back musically. So I picked the all black rap band, all black ragtime band. And they got this shit called, they did a cover for a song that just came out that year, 1918, called Russian Rag. And it's hard. Just some real. Um, Watch ogre, him, ogre, yeah, like yeah. warmonger, because he's a warmonger at this point. So I'm spoofing the warmonger. What's the biggest warmongers on the planet? Russians. So, you know, in my opinion, outside of America, but you know, whatever, I'm not knocking nobody, just that overall authoritarian kind of. So I'm spoofing that in my battle rap against him. And so I beatboxed that and I sent it to Known Beats to finish it. And I sent him the samples and the loops and everything. He put that shit together. Uh, Daddy Kev and, and Cosmic Zoo and them and some other people, you know, put that mix together for me. And I just came with, I was like, well, he was he been fucking with you since the tomb and making concern. So I took running butt nigga from Seven Seal as part of my court. You know, I'm breaking it down like that. Running butt nigga, the sterile in the flames. I don't give a fuck where you from, what's that you claim? Any monkey get it, take aim, blow out your brains. I got nails for that box and you laying against the grain. And I just came with it, but before I knew it, I heard it back, and it had might to it, and and husky kind of kind of some, it had some, you know. I'm like, oh shit, you know. I'm like, so I ended up recording four or five more joints, all kind of other shit, like, oh, you know, motherfucker, and, you know, you letting them bro, live in your head like that, make you buck wild like that? Nah, man. <laughs> but he primed me a little bit. I was just like, well, shit, I'm just going to come with some shit. And still got way more cray-cray, but, like, on this one, I was just like, okay, he's going to get this work real quick. Let me just go ahead and slide him real quick. But I was like, I listened back. I was like, oh, that shit hit nice, though. Like, I liked it as a song and a rhyme. I never... Did my own YouTube channel, so I was like, put this shit on YouTube. Me and Cool sat down, did the video. I did it old timey noir with the uh, black and white shit. We find a little cartoon shit that goes perfectly with the lyrics, and then when it's radio silence, and then you do the little shit with the words, but it's no words, and just mm. having fun with this shit. Not, not you know, not taking nobody you know that that serious on on anything else other than the hip hop shit, trash talking. You know, people try to poly it out and want to inject themselves into the peace process, which I respect. You know, another personal. Mutual friends of ours, you know, saying this and that. But I'm like, wait, he dragged me for two years and, and got the platform he got and dissed me and my crew and, and LA Underground. Like a week or two after I put the record out, somebody was, you know, like, all right, you got it out your system. You ready to patch? A few people were. I was like, nah, I need to let that live for at least a young year or so. Mm -hmm. You know, I need, need to let that eat. But, you know, I go to the table anytime, go by myself. I don't need no bodyguards, nothing. You know, that's Tali, you know, that's my bro. But, you know, you're tripping, you're like, a little off code with all that, all that, all that fuckery, but 
nonetheless, I was like, no, I'm banging back for mine. So if I hear anything else or anything else, I mean, it's been radio silent pretty much since then. So and ain't nobody really been atting at me or nothing. And you know, in the streets, nobody really be getting at me. Most of the time, people be like, man, why you do that boy like that? I'm in a dispensary somewhere. They're like, why you do that boy like that? <laughs> I'm back east somewhere. I'm in Canada somewhere. People are like, I, I'm, you know, I'm still kind of like on my my peas. Like, like, what if some people come at you a different way? But most of them just like, yeah, he he off cold. He was wrong for that, man. You know, at first I had his back, but now I, I dug deep. You know, did a dive on it. And like, nah. So it's just like, leave me alone. <laughs> no doubt. But uh, you know, I'm I'm glad to hear that that uh, you know, at at some point it sounds like it it could be fixable. So that's that's what's up. Yeah, just but leave uh, me alone at this point. <laughs> but nah, that's my bro, man. But, <laughs> but nah, that's my bro, man. But glad it's fixable. It's always fixable. It's always always cool. Yeah. So it's a fantastic work of art. Oh, uh, yes. My kaleidoscope. Shout out Brian Cross picture. Shout out Parker Pubs. All area crew. Hold tight. It's already legendary, but it puts the legend on paper in a way that's just it's is is beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful story. You've led you've led and continue to lead a beautiful life. So thank you for your time, OG. And what a pleasure it is to talk to you, man. All love, man. And congrats, all things open, Mike Eagle. Appreciate you. Thanks for watching that. And if you dug that, leave a thumbs up and say what up in the comments. And make sure to subscribe to Stony Island Audio, Stony Island Audio. for more.